Hello. In this segment, we're going to be talking about input and output, and three techniques for performing input and output. Programmed I.O., interrupts, and DMA, direct memory access. The characteristics of, of input and output are that it is several orders of magnitude slower than accessing memory. And as we saw previously, accessing memory is several orders of magnitude slower than the CPU itself. So this is particularly slow for getting access to. We have character versus block-based transfers, and we have burst versus steady-state transfers. So any solution that we come up with needs to address those different characteristics. The three approaches that we have for I.O. are programmed I.O., interrupt-driven, and direct memory access. In programmed I.O., the CPU is going to be responsible for reading and writing to devices. And we're going to have special input and output instructions on the CPU. This is the way the little man computer handles this situation. We're going to have an I.O. data register and an I.O. Ad address register that are mirror images of the memory data register and the memory address register. And each device is going to be assigned its own unique address. So the CPU then will form an instruction that's either an input or output and use the address that's associated with the particular device in order to read or write it. There's an alternative called memory mapped I.O. where instead of having a special I.O. address register and I.O. data register, we reserve certain locations in memory and treat them as if those were the I.O. ports. This simplifies the programmer interface, but it's slightly more complicated in terms of the control circuitry. The problems that we run into with all programmed I.O. is that we are constantly checking to see if there is actually data that's ready to be read or written. And so we have to use a polling loop, which is also known as a busy wait, to send and receive data to devices. Here's what that might look like in assembly language. We first get the address of the keyboard status, because we're going to read from the keyboard. Then we load the status data from that address. We and it with a 1 to see if the ready flag is set. And if it's not set, then the result will be 0, and we'll go back up to the waiting portion again and load the status data again, check the ready flag again, see if it's set, and so on. Eventually, the keyboard will have data that's ready for us to read, and so the BRZ will not happen, and instead we'll go out to the keyboard buffer and actually load up the data from the keyboard. But in the meantime, we've sat in this loop that's just continually pulling the keyboard over and over and over again. Well, as fast as some touch typists are, the, the CPU can actually execute millions, if not billions, of instructions while it's sitting here waiting for somebody to press a key on the keyboard. So this is not a very good approach. An alternative is to use what's called an interrupt-driven approach. Because busy waits are pulling waste resources, uh, even though it has simpler hardware, we still need to have an alternative that involves not having those busy waits. So the idea is, is that after the CPU requests some, uh, some I.O., we let the I.O. device notify the CPU when the data is ready, rather than the CPU going out and asking if it's ready on a continual basis. And this is called an interrupt. So the way this works is, is that each device is assigned an individual interrupt request line. This is just a signal that we uh, would assert. And the I.O. controller sets the IRQ line status high when the data is ready. So the CPU will detect that the IRQ is high at the beginning of the fetch execute cycle. It'll save its state and then switch to a special subroutine called an I.O. handler that will actually process the data that was uh, ready from the device. Uh, after the routine services the request, then control will be returned to the previously executing code. So we're going to switch back and forth on our CPU between handlers and the program that we want to execute. Here's a picture of the way this works, the way we would have to change the fetch and execute cycle. We replace the portion at the beginning where we're fetching the next instruction with a question. Is there any I.O. pending? Is there an IRQ line that's set high? If so, then we'll save the program counter and the program status word to a special location in memory, and we will replace those with the program status word and the program counter that are needed for the I.O. handler. And then it'll continue into the fetch cycle. But that fetch cycle will fetch the first instruction from the I.O. handler rather from, than the next instruction from the program that we were previously executing. At the end, when the handler is finished, we will replace the old program status word and the old program counter with the ones that we saved off into memory. And so we will return to executing the program that we were previously executing. The issues here is that we're going to have additional control hardware naturally, because we're modifying the fetch and execute cycle. We'll also have to be able to queue up interrupts, because 
while we're processing one interrupt, we could get interrupted by another I.O. device. And so we don't want to lose those interrupts. We want to save them in a line. Also, we need to be able to mask interrupts, turn off the ability for uh, a particular subroutine to be interrupted at all. And we have to be able to register our I.O. handlers with uh, the, the hardware so that they know what subroutine to execute in response to an IRQ. And this is actually part of the operating system. There are some problems with uh, interrupt-driven I.O., and that is that the CPU is still involved with each interrupt. And uh, furthermore, this only transfers a single byte or a single word at a time. What we would really like is the ability to have multiple bytes processed with a single interrupt. Because disks and networks transfer thousands of bytes at a single time, there's too much overhead for the CPU to be constantly going back and forth, transferring a byte at a time. The solution to this is something that's called DMA, direct memory access. We're going to add a specialized kind of CPU that can directly transfer data from the device to the memory without uh, interrupting our main CPU. Here's a block diagram of what that might look like. So we start out our I.O. request by having the CPU issue a programmed I.O. instruction to specify the memory address where we want the transfer to take place to. The operation, either a read or write, the number of bytes we want to transfer, and then, of course, a location on the disk that we're going to read or write from or to. The DMA controller then is going to initiate the I.O. with the device controller. The device controller then will interact with the disk or the network. And when it's done, it will send the data back to the DMA controller. The DMA controller then will receive that data and transfer it directly into memory. Once that's completed, the DMA controller will then interrupt the CPU to notify it that the data transfer is complete. At this point in time, the CPU handles the interrupt using an interrupt handler, but the difference is, is that it has been interrupted only once instead of many times for a whole block of bytes. Now, this is going to re require arbitration to memory so that either the CPU or the DMA controller can access it at, at once, or it will require dual-ported memory that can be accessed simultaneously by both. In summary, a purely programmed I.O. Uh, approach requires special I.O. instructions and special I.O. data and address registers, and it uses polling loops that waste clock cycles to see if data is ready. Interrupt-driven I.O., on the other hand, avoids the busy waiting, but it's not suitable for large block transfers because we're always going to be interrupting the CPU a byte at a time. DMA controllers combine the two earlier approaches of programmed I.O. and IRQ handlers with another special controller that transfers large amounts of data uh, in a block directly to memory. And this is efficient because then at the end we only get a single interrupt for our main CPU.